Hope everybody's doing well today, and I want to welcome Catherine Kellogg to the Unimpressed podcast. And I'm unimpressed that I haven't heard more about what she's doing because I think she's doing something great for the environment, this eco-friendly living. And her website is goingzerowaste.com. So we're going to get into that on today's show. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. What town are you in outside San Francisco? Berkeley. Berkeley, California. What's going on in Berkeley? Anything good? What's not going on in Berkeley? <laughs> what is, what's Berkeley known for over there? Hippies. Hippies. Yeah, fit right in. <laughs> Hence, eco-friendly sustainable. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your passion, your family, you know, where this came from. How did you find this vein and direction to head for your career? You know, what's going on with you? Yeah, so I actually majored in musical theater and mass communications. I was a professional actor and have performed. I'm so passionate about theater. And I really started making a lot of these changes out of financial necessity, as I'm sure you know, uh, stage actors, especially we don't make a ton of money. So I started switching out a lot of disposable products for reusable ones to save money. And I was having a lot of health issues. I had a really bad hormonal imbalance. And so I started paying a lot more attention to what was in my product. So plastic is a known endocrine disruptor, which means it interferes with our hormones, synthetic estrogen, BPA, as I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, uh, as well as cleaning products and beauty products and just started living a more natural lifestyle. When I moved out to California, it kind of all clicked for me that the changes I was making for my personal health and financial health weren't only better for me, but also better for the planet. So I started my blog really to kind of keep in touch with friends and family. And it was something that was very personal and something that was more designed to just foster relationships rather than become a business. But when I started talking more about a lot of the changes I was making, it just became a really, really popular. And I wound up being a spokesperson for National Geographic. I'm the author of two books. And it's been really fantastic to see how the platform has grown. Wow. So being a spokesperson for National Geographic, how did you get there and what does that entail? So there was an issue that came out, I believe it was 2018, the planet or plastic issue. And they interviewed me for the magazine and I was on their Instagram account and they asked me to do be their spokesperson and do some lives. So I did a Facebook live, I did a Reddit AMA, and it was just all about how to reduce plastic in our daily lives. And it was absolutely fantastic getting to work with them. I will say my third grade self would be so proud, so proud. Let's break down your day, okay? So you get up, you get out of bed. What kind of toothbrush do you use? A bamboo toothbrush. A bamboo toothbrush. Okay. How about toothpaste? So when I travel, I like to use toothpaste tabs, which are, they look kind of like pills and you bite down on them and you use them. But I also use a toothpaste that has fluoride in it and it's partnered with TerraCycle. So I have a small box of tubes that I keep underneath my sink and then I just send them all back to be recycled once I'm done with them. Okay. Well, all right. Now let's go to, what do you go to next? You go to the face? The yeah, hair. I wash my face. Yeah, <laughs> hair as well. Uh, so the shampoo I use comes in a hundred percent recycled plastic container, which is which is really cool. And I do blow dry my hair. However, I have had my blow dryer since middle school, and that's probably my biggest flex. How about makeup? Is there a makeup deal? Yeah. Yes, I do. I do wear makeup, and it's been really fun looking at more sustainable alternatives. So I actually have my chapstick next to me, which comes in a cardboard tube. And the mascara I use is fully refillable, which is really neat. It's from Izzy Beauty. So there's, and then as well as using refillable palettes. So it's kind of where you buy the container once and then you buy the refills. So it just reduces overall packaging waste. My family and my household, we kind of live that lifestyle. So I kind of know the processes and, you know, the the, the wood uh, toothbrushes and, and so forth, because my wife is a, a fanatic about those things. And I see you have a tab on your website about food. What type of foods are you into and how does that work out daily? So food is a great place if you want to start reducing waste. On average, 40% of all the food in the United States goes to waste. And in fact, with just a fraction of it, we could feed every food insecure household. So, so much food goes to waste and food doesn't break down in landfills. A lot of people put their food scraps in the trash, but landfills are designed for storage, not decomposition. So none of that is breaking down. And instead it's releasing methane, which is on average about 30 times more powerful than your average greenhouse gas, which means it stays in the atmosphere 
longer and it just creates more heat. So it's more powerful. And one of the best things you can do is to avoid wasting food by you know going to the grocery store, buying what you need, storing your food properly so it has a maximum longevity and then composting. So when you do need to throw out your food scraps, then they're going to be turned back into a nutrient rich soil instead of sitting around in a landfill for a very long time. You ever heard of Purium Health Products? Mm-mm. I don't know. I, I take Purium every day. It's an organic product. Superfoods. It's superfoods every day. That's interesting. That, so the foods don't go away if they're thrown in the garbage. They just turn into waste and toxic. So when they excavated some landfills, they found hot dogs and guacamole preserved in newspapers from the 1950s. And these are three items that would normally break down very quickly. I mean, can you imagine finding perfectly preserved guacamole in a landfill when guacamole turns brown in about 30 seconds in real life? You have a certain type of diet, you know, because I think Americans overall eat too much, you know, and we probably produce more foods than we should. Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, animal agriculture is one of the top five most polluting industries. And just by eating less meat and fewer animal products is a fantastic way to have a positive impact on the environment, as well as considering food miles and supporting local farms, especially ones that are practicing sustainable and regenerative practices is a great way to have a positive impact. So you have a program uh, on your website that's going zero waste.com for beginners here. What's your thought process with that? Yeah, so I created a 31 day zero waste challenge, which is a ton of fun. It was really a lot of fun to make. And the idea behind it is that you start really small. So it starts off with buying less. And then it goes into kind of simple swaps, you know, if you're getting warmed up. And then in the middle, it uh, goes to a little bit more advanced swap. And then at the end of it, it's talking kind of about larger, more systemic change, which is so vital and so necessary and so important about getting involved in your local government and writing your legislators and writing businesses and how we can have a positive effect just beyond our daily consumer actions. You're in Berkeley, California. Where did you come from? Did you go to Berkeley for this purpose, for this lifestyle and for the community? So I'm from Arkansas. And Arkansas, okay. I love Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we're I'm, in Arkansas. Uh, Little Rock. Little Rock. Well, the only reason I ask, we have an artist, Kristen Tough Scott, that we represent. She's from uh, Pickett, Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah, so. I know exactly where that is. I love that. Yeah, so I'm from Arkansas. My, my dad was in the military, so we moved around quite a bit. But San Antonio, Texas and Little Rock, Arkansas are two places that I really consider home because that's where both my grandparents live. So those are very kind of grounding places when we spend a lot of time there in the summers. So and then after college, I was in Pennsylvania performing. And that's where I met my husband, who we lived across the hall in actor housing. And we know each other for about six weeks. And he was coming out to California to go to school for audio engineering. And he said, Hey, so do you want to like come with me to California? I said, why not? So we packed up and moved to California and that's how I wound up out here. Does he get out of line with his lifestyle a little bit? You have to get him in line. I think that the best way to create positive change in someone else's life is to be very hands-off. So it's about coming to those decisions of your own accord. So I'm not the kind of person that nags or I'm not the kind of person that is like, your lifestyle is different than mine. I made these choices for me. And so many of them make sense, especially for us as a household. So using reusable towels saves us a lot of money compared to using disposable towels. And so, so many of the changes he was just automatically on board with, and there's some that he'll never be on board with. And that's okay. That's totally fine. Because if you start in your home and you look at the country as a whole, I mean, how do we tackle these corporations that are still capitalizing bad things? How do you take that approach? I mean, how do we go after the bigger picture here to really make a bigger change? I believe it's 71% of all emissions come from just 100 companies, right? So individual action is really important because it's a signal in the market to say there's demand for change. And that's why it's not about you and me being perfect and the whole sole crux of the problem resting on our shoulders. Instead, it's about using our actions as leverage to prove that people want sustainable change. We want businesses to be held accountable and we want our policy to be holding these businesses accountable. So one of the best things, of course, is to message them, talk to them, create things, petitions, talk to our legislators and hopefully create sustainable change. I mean, one of the pieces of legislation that I'm so currently passionate about is the Break Free from Plastic Act. And that's currently in our legislation and it would require companies to have more extended producer responsibility over their plastics and be using 
recycled materials in their products, which would boost the overall recycling market. And so creating good common sense policy is also a fantastic way to make sure we're holding a lot of these larger corporations accountable. Do you have any specific goals the next three years that you really want to tackle? You really want to approach? One of the big goals I'm really working on for this summer specifically is focusing on more legislation. So I find that a lot of people don't really know where to start, how to find legislation. They don't know who they should be talking to or how to talk to them. And I actually did this for Earth Day. I created postcards that were going to legislators. They were already pre-filled out and they were postcards about them supporting certain bills and certain topics. So all you had to do was print them out, sign them and put a stamp on them and send them. So that way it was an easy way to create action and show support or opposition for a bill that was currently happening. What's going on, you know, out there in California, you know, with what you do and with the pandemic, how did that work? So that year? really shifted a lot of my habits. And I'm actually was, I'm kind of excited about it. Not about the pandemic. I was not excited about that at all. But just the change in habit was just very eye opening for me. A box of laundry detergent was $16.60. But if you bought it without the packaging from the bulk bins, so it was a bulk bin and you'd scoop it into your own container, it was only $1.85 a pound. So the savings were astronomical for bringing your own containers. With COVID, so many of the bulk stores, and especially my closest bulk store that I can walk to, all of the bins are closed. I, I can't participate in that anymore. And it just really reinforced for me the idea that it's not up to a few individuals to be shopping package free. We need just better systems. We need more companies who are taking responsibility over their packaging and over their waste. And even though I'm really not able to buy much without a package anymore, my trash can is about three feet tall. I still only took my trash can out about once a month of just from getting food packaging. And that was also really eye opening because it meant that all the other changes I was making were still really impactful and you don't have to have access to tons of bulk bins and you don't have to have access to tons of sustainable shops to still make a really positive difference in your own home and with your own trash. I don't know what the answer is, right? But if you think about how things have slowed down from manufacturing, from things being delivered, you know, it seems like the whole country is right now slow. We're in that line. How do we interject something better? Because obviously it can be manipulated and it can be controlled. I don't know where we go with that or how to figure that out, but I think there's something there from that standpoint, seeing these lines and of communication and these lines of manufacturing slowing down drastically drastically that we didn't know before, per se. Yeah, we absolutely need a just recovery and we need a recovery that's focused on sustainability. And are you familiar with Earth Overshoot Day? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, so on the calendar, there's a day that marks when we've sustainably consumed all of the resources the Earth can produce in one year. So in 2019, we hit it on July 31st. We're essentially consuming two Earth's worth of resources every single year. And the first Earth Overshoot Day was in 1970. So we have been consuming more resources than the Earth can produce for 50 years. And last year in 2020, Earth Overshoot Day was August 6th. So even with all of the shutdowns and even with everything that happened in early March, we still bought ourselves one week, which means we really need to start rethinking how consumption works, how resource production works and really trying to find a new way of looking at things. And one of the books I can really highly recommend is Donut Economics. We just read it with my book club and it's fantastic about how we can create sustainable lives while still living within our planetary means. I interviewed Terry Virts. He is an astronaut, retired astronaut, and he's the one, I don't know, he was the commander of the space station, right? And when Spock died, he's the one that did the signal from space. It got a lot of hype. You know, he talks about, you know, the earth is always moving and they talk about global warming. And it's really it's really more about where the earth is moving when you talk about the, the warming and the change of climates and how much closer it is to the sun and so forth. But he says the things like in space, there's space trash that's not being, you know, controlled. You know, that's why this space force thing should be a good thing to kind of regulate because these people like Tesla and so forth are like sending up stuff, but they don't have an exit strategy. So it's a very similar principle in space that it is on the Earth. He's saying that the Earth can reset itself with five or six volcanoes. Get rid of everything that's here. So finding a narrative that is more knowledge-based with what you do, 
right? So we don't get to that point where Earth erupts. Instead of pushing the envelope way up here where things are being capitalized, right? Instead of pushing people one way or another. So the environment absolutely shouldn't be politicized. And what you're saying is is correct that at the end of the day, we're not fighting for a habitable earth, a habitable earth for the earth. We're fighting for a habitable earth for humans. You know, the earth will be here, uh, but humans and other species m might not, right? So it's it's more about creating and self-preservation than just for the earth. Flipping the idea from a selfless principle to a selfish one. And I absolutely think when we talk to people who have different viewpoints, right? Because we all want the same thing. Who wants to breathe polluted air? Who wants dirty water running out of their faucets? No one wants these things. So how can we find the common ground and how can we work on that together? I think if you look at knowledge-based, I think there's a better narrative to bring both sides together because, you know, you got one side, uh, you know, it's my parents, you know, they're in their 70s. They've lived the same way their whole life. And now they realize that how they were living is not 100% correct. So what I'm saying is instead of like pushing like that, you know, the hippie world and whatever it is, you know, pushing that to the extreme. How do we make this narrative more mainstream for everybody? I mean, it does have to be personal and you have to find what's important to you. So if you love to ski and you love going up to the mountains, then how is that going to affect you with the amount of snow that's going to be happening in the future? If you love to surf and you're constantly seeing your beach littered with plastic, if you love fashion and you don't want to support industries that are using slave labor, then how, how can you make better choices, right? It's all about what you're passionate about and learning to speak the language to the person you're, you're talking to. So when I talk to my dad or my granddad about a lot of these changes, right, they love saving money. So instead of focusing just on, well, it's better for the planet, uh, instead it's, well, this is how you can save money and this is how this is going to help you and finding the ways to talk to each person's own interest. You are on your game, aren't you? You're pretty good. <laughs> I try. <laughs> You're pretty good. I always think there's a better, better narrative for anything that's helping a situation, helping people, helping the environment. I just think sometimes we oversell one way or the other because it's so strong on either side, it pushes people away. They don't really think about it. So I think if there's a way to like make that narrative educational, like you were just talking about the waters, the the snow and so forth, you might be able to get people's attention then and, and really make a, a bigger impact. Tell me a little bit about your books and so forth. Yes. Yeah, so I've got two books. One is called 101 Ways to Go Zero Waste. It is a, an actionable handbook. And the idea behind it that I wanted to create was the book that I wanted when I first started trying to live a more sustainable life. So you don't have to read it cover to cover. It's literally 101 tips and you can flip to the exact tip you need, learn everything you need to know, and then go about your day. Um, my second book is Zero Waste Kids, which is really cute. And it's all illustrated. It's for children. And unfortunately, due to COVID, its US release has been stalled, but it is currently available in the UK. And I just finished my German translation, which is very exciting. Awesome. I see you have a shop on here. Your favorite products. I, let's get into that a little bit. I see favorite products. You know, a few of my favorite products up first has to be my French press. So instead of using a coffee machine that uses pods, I just use a French press. And I used to use pods in college. And I have to say the French press does a much better cup of coffee. And one of the things I find really interesting about Keurig, so let me know if this is tangenting too much, is it's very, very, very difficult to repair a Keurig. And that's because it's designed intentionally to not be a product that has longevity. So when it comes to looking for products for me, I try to find simple things that are going to have longevity. And a French press unless I break the glass beaker, which I have done once, uh, should last a lot longer than that Keurig I ever did. Or I, I, I ever had that Keurig in college. That's one of my favorite products. Uh, another one that I really like is a bidet attachment for the toilet. I cannot recommend that enough. And so during the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, I was not worried at all because we had a bidet attachment. And the US is so far behind when it comes to bidets because so many so many other countries, the days are just standard. And I, I wish I could change that. Well, let me ask you this. Is there a way to look at the economics of that and say, hey, here's a product that's going to last 10 years compared to the product you've been buying in the last two years, right? And price that product at la last 10 years to cover the cost of that product at last two years. Think people would buy into something like that? 
Absolutely. So on my Instagram, I actually have a whole series called Financial Savings Breakdown, where I go into how much money I've saved using the reusable product versus the disposable product. Things like paper towels uh, is another is another really good example. I don't remember all the numbers off the top of my head, but I know that the I believe for paper towels, the savings was is comes out to around four thousand dollars over five years. Wow! I think you're on your game, and I think you're really good at what you do. And I appreciate what you're doing. And I think we need more people like you. Is there anything else you want to mention before we get off here? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been fantastic chatting with you. Uh, you flatter me so much, so thank you. <laughs> and I guess my my final closing thought would be, you know, we talked about so many things, right? We've talked about composting. Um, you know, buying less, switching out some disposal products for reusables. And if anyone wants to make a change, you know, and many of these changes, you know, are going to save you money is just to pick one and it's overwhelmed. So uh, pick something that you're excited about changing and just really commit to it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if you want to check out Catherine Kellogg's stuff, go to goingzerowaste.com, as we mentioned before. And Catherine, I appreciate you coming on the show. And I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. (laughs) 